and hopefully everybody can see that. There we go. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you to coming, uh, for coming to this, our fourth webinar of 2020. Um, the Small Sales Drives Microwave Backhaul Boom Forecast was released at the end of July, and we decided to host the event in September, allowing for the summer vacation period to pass. So far this year, the RAN Research Service has delivered forecasts on RAN investments, RAN and core migration strategies, private networks and shared spectrum, and now this one. Uh, in the coming month, we'll be releasing a new forecast, and that will be looking at the open RAN. Now, for those of you who don't know Phil Hunter, he, like Caroline, is based in London, and he has been working with Peter and Caroline, our founders, for many, many years. He currently writes a weekly analysis piece for Wireless Watch, and has previously worked on our other publications, Riot and Fog. Research-wise, Phil has produced and contributed work for IoT forecasting arm Riot Research and has contributed to RAM Research as well as Rethink TV. With a degree in mathematics, Phil has worked and written about technology for over 40 years. And uh, hence, uh, Phil has written for a lot of international technology magazines, consumer and business publications. And in short, he has a very deep understanding of the industry and the technology. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to this event, and I will be passing over in a second to Caroline Gabriel. Over to you, Caroline. Great. Thanks, John. Um, thank you to um, everybody for joining today. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm the research director here, and um, I'd like to uh, add to John's words um, to, to welcome Phil to the RAN research practice. As I said, he's worked with us for many years, and he's been contributing to wireless watch for, uh, for quite some time, but um, this is his debut uh, report within our, our RAN practice, which sort of leads us to the question of why are we adding backhaul to a program which is entitled RAN. Um, in previous network generations, uh, we think backhaul has, has too often really been considered seriously only after the RAN has been planned and deployed, um, often when bottlenecks were appearing because the backhaul capacity had not been planned proactively to match up. Uh, with what had been deployed in, in the access. And similarly, research coverage of the backhaul market tended to be quite distinct from that of the RAN. In 5G, however, it's obvious that it is impossible to split the network into domains in the same way. This time, operators are planning from end to end, especially where they're virtualizing their networks and introducing software-defined networking and slicing, both examples of technologies which only really deliver their maximum efficiencies and flexibility if they work across all domains. This slide shows some of the ways in which backhaul and RAN must be considered holistically in 5G, and that will increasingly be knitted into our overall forecasts. These relate to three main aspects of 5G network decision making. Uh, one, densification, um, with large numbers of smaller base stations being deployed over the coming decade. There's also densification of fibre and other backhaul links required to support so many cells and achieve the targeted aggregate capacity, and, and Phil will discuss that in some detail. And it also raises new issues at the cell site. You know, for instance, is there fibre to a lamp post, and does that make it appropriate for hosting a small cell? Second factor, the desire to transform cost and ownership models in 5G. The right balance of fibre and wireless is a decision in the access network as converged operators start to look at what will deliver the best uh, cost base and ROI. But of course, it's also one for the transport, as is the best balance between buying and implementing backhaul yourself or leasing it um, via a, an OPEX model. It's CAPEX versus OPEX, very important part of uh, operators' 5G cost planning at the moment. And the third main area where these two domains um, are increasingly uh, are blurring together, the new RAN architectures, um, particularly the virtualized RAN, which introduces front hall and mid hall to the picture with uh, very demanding latency and capacity requirements on fiber compared to, uh, uh, to traditional backhaul. We're also seeing the convergence of edge computing and rising support for very reliable or very low latency connectivity. All of these put new demands on the backhaul as well as the access, and if those are not addressed, uh, 5G will not deliver uh, it, its full potential. So all these factors impact on the network from end to end, which is why we thought it was very important to move into backhaul and launch um, our, our first report in this area. And increasingly going forward, you'll see more elements um, of multi-domain uh, analysis and forecasting um, as we look deeper into the 5G deployment models. Um, we may even change the name of the practice one day, but that's for another day. Um, so now to take us through the highlights of the new forecast uh, and some points of analysis, I'll hand over to Phil. 
Okay. Okay. Um, next slide, please. And um, thank you, Caroline and um, John. Before that, um, that really sets the scene quite well because I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, the idea of a name change is something that we <laughs> may even think about. But I mean, I mean, we've not been saying here that backhaul hasn't been considered before. I mean, it was more that, as Caroline said, that it was sort of um, it had to sort of follow in the slipstream of the discussion about the RAN, whereas now really you can't really separate the RAN, the backhaul and the core network um, in any discussion about mobile. It's really the whole end-to-end -end picture is your mobile infrastructure and service. So in, um, that sets the stage for a, my quick snapshot of the forecast that we have just compiled and findings. I mean, essentially, it was in two parts. There's a forecast looking at trends in numbers of backhaul connections broken down by backhaul technology and region. And then there was a discussion, a more in-depth discussion of the technologies, particularly around the two principal backhaul options, which are optical fiber and wireless or microwave, however you want to call it. And um, we sort of identify the key themes in each sort of, I mean, there's been quite a swing towards dense wavelength division multiplexing or DWDM, as well as higher bits per wavelengths on the optical side. And um, one of the trends we're seeing on the wireless side is the rise of integrated backhaul, which we'll be looking more at. And that, that combines the backhaul or the front hall, and that's part between the radio head and the baseband controllers. Um, and the RAN over the same spectrum. So a challenge there is flexibility to make sure that the capacity can be directed on demand to where it's needed, which in turn sort of um, dovetails with one of 5G's major benefits, which is network slicing to meet varying demands or different use cases. So this um, this slide here just sort of highlights a few of the major trends that we're seeing. And um, okay, so I, I think probably the key point is that we've got some global trends that we're looking at. And then there's also some quite stark regional differences over some of the other aspects. And the report really tries to tease those out and sort of um, explain what why these differences occur. I mean, but one example of that is the um, prevalence of small cells and the choice of actual backhaul technology, which does vary quite a bit between region. So um, next slide, please. Thank you. So here we've got a sort of look at um, macro cells, which is um, which really, very, I mean, they're very different from small cells. And that's reflected in their backhaul profile. I mean, um, fiber will be very much in the ascendant in macro cells. And, and, and as it rolls out, it will increase its penetration of backhaul over the forecast period. And that's, that's just in line with deployment, ongoing rollout in the field by fixed operators and others, you know, propelled in many cases. Um, by government investment. So, so, um, so, I mean, we forecast global fiber penetration in macro backhaul by a number of, this is by a number of connections increasing from 41.7% in 2019 to 569 by 2026. And if you look there, you'll see that microwave is broken down into three categories, sort of, um, sub six gigahertz, seven to 40, and then 41 plus, which is growing with the deployment of millimeter wave. And that's very much in line with the um, GSMA's approach of splitting microwave up. So in a sense, it means that our forecast sort of dovetails very much with any, any of the snapshots that they put out. And, and, and also, I mean, each of those three groups is to some extent a distinct category and they sort of move in the market slightly independently of each other. The key point you'll see that by, by 2026 or something, not a, a point probably, is that um, microwave will still be a significant presence in 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 in, in macro cell backhaul because fiber just despite all those advance, advances in DWDM and um, greater speed bit rate per wavelength, you know, going up from 100 gigabits per second to 200 and 400 and possibly even approaching 800 gigabits per second wavelength. 
towards 2026 um, won't provide enough capacity on its own for operators to migrate everything over to that backhaul. Next slide, please. Thank you. Yes, um, what I've done here, and look, could I go back to the previous one? Yeah, the, thank you. Um, yeah, that's uh, uh, what I've done here is, a, is just follow on from the global picture for macroethyl backhaul to take a snapshot of just one of the regions, Europe, which, um, as you can see, it's, it, it's very much, it, it's a similar profile to the global, global situation, but the difference is that um, microwave is holding up more strongly in Europe. In fact, um, if you add the three categories together, they still exceed fiber, even by 2026, although fiber will have just overtaken mid, the mid-range microwave, 7 to 40 gigahertz, which is a leading category. So fiber rollouts will be proceeding in Europe, but uh, there will still be a large number of um, macro cell towers unreached in areas of sort of intermediate population density in some of the countries. And uh, in the report, we have similar graphs and data for all, all the regions, and we sort of um, analyze some of the differences in somewhat more detail. So um, next slide, please. Well, here we're sort of coming back to look at small cells and the global picture. Um, and the headline is that there'll be a global swing from wireless, from fiber to wireless there. But that would be, at, in a, to some extent, overridden by the massive growth in number of small cells generally. Um, I mean, the share taken by fiber will shrink from 53 to 42%, while microwave it, across all categories. Um, Rises from 41 to 49, that percent, I think, or, or 55 percent, um, so well over half if you include self backhaul in that category. But with that rapid growth in um, in small cells, and it doesn't actually show up on this. Oh, yes, it does. Yeah, we've got those totals on the slides. Um, the, the total number of small cells would be increasing from 1.4 million in 2019 to, we think, 12.1. 7 million in 2026. So that means there'll be a hell of an increase in fiber backhaul there as well, about sevenfold from 747 cells and connections in 2019 to 5.1 million in 2026. Um, next slide, please. Well, oh, just um, just interrupting you one moment. Um, I, I think that small cell one is really interesting because it seems counterintuitive that the percentage of fibre goes down, although, of course, taking your point that the, the numbers of links are going up. Do you have any sense for what's driving um, uh, fibre to reduce as a percentage against microwave? Well, maybe, maybe it's best to look at it the other way. Well, not the other way, rather. Um, is that fiber, um, operators will be sort of looking to get fiber into small cells in many cases and will succeed, but the proliferation of it uh, means they won't always be able to find it or obtain it. Mm -hmm. and, and meanwhile, there'll be sort of more and more use of or ability to use microwave there. So it'll be, it, it'd be almost by default a lot, a lot more fiber, but <laughs> even more, even more gain yes. in the, yeah. So it's, so it's still a sort of constrained demand, um, as constrained supply, sorry, of fibre, even in 2026 is, is a yeah. Is picture. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, so what I've um, moved on to here is, um, so in, 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 instead of looking at um, regions by backhaul category, we're now looking at backhaul category by regions. So they're just sort of flipping the flipping this cube over a little bit. And so um, if we look at fiber from 2019 and 2026, it really does it, it really does give you a picture of where the overall numbers are going and, and the actual preponderance is. So I mean, bearing in mind again that we're seeing big rises all around, but um, in China where you, you, you think there's a lot of fiber being built, it would actually account for slightly smaller percentage of total fiber backhaul in the world by 2026 and 2019. That's really just sort of illustrative. And, 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 uh, and there's some underlying technical trends behind this, which we discuss in the report. And that's one of them is a steady spring towards DWDM, as well as that rise per wavelength. So we're seeing the average capacity of each fiber connection rising a lot over the forecast period, but not quite enough to meet all that demand from the RAN. So as we say, um, 
So the next slide, please. I just one back, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so that's this is a corresponding slide for, we're here just looking at high-end microwave, as I call it, that's the sort of um, microwave above 41 gigahertz, because I think that's sort of showing the um, strongest growth over the next six years from a sort of slower start. Um, we, see, we see Asia Pacific, including China, Middle East and Africa, getting maybe proportionately more than Europe and North America. In, in fact, um, if you look at Asia Pacific, excluding China, um, microwave is dominant at present. And um, although fiber is gaining like everywhere, its penetration of macro cell backhaul connections will still be below 30% in 2026. That's something we look at elsewhere in the report. And um, that reflects um, pretty slow investment in many developing nations of the world, of, of, the, of that region. And that includes even India, where there's quite a lot of high profile fiber deployments, but they're found in just some, of, some of the great cities. So if you project mid-range um, mid microwave, that's in the 7 to 40 gigahertz area, um, still accounting for over half of all micro cell, micro, sorry, macro cell connections in that region by 2026. And all, I mean, all, uh, the other thing is that technical advances that will make millimeter wave um, more suitable for backhaul, especially for small cells, are discussed in some detail in the report. And uh, for examples include directional beam forming and ray tracing. So if you're interested in more in-depth look at some of the technology and science behind those, you can find that in the report. But of course, if, if that's more than you need to know, you can just sort of um, tread, tread around through the more, some, more, some more headline details. And that's the um, end of my quick run through um, a few bits of report. So if I could hand back, I think it's to Caroline or John, I mean, we can devote some time to any further questions that you may have or that may have come in. Yeah, thank you for that, Phil, and uh, thank you, Caroline. Um, yeah, we've had a few questions come through, uh, and just to, to repeat, um, we if you have a question, fire it across now, and I'll put it through to, to Phil. Um, we've had a few come through, Phil, so uh, I'll read out the first one to you. Um, the report focuses on growth in connections and the underlying technologies, but what about capacity? What trends will we see and how will these impact decisions over the choice of backhaul medium? Oh yeah, thanks, John. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I mean, we do we do discuss capacity in the report, but there's no specific forecast of that. I mean, um, the thing is, five G, as we know, probably is huge increases in capacity, and um, they can't be met entirely through, in fact, not barely at all through efficiency improvements. So, in these additional spectrum, which is coming partly through reclaiming stuff in the middle. In the, <clears throat> In the middle bands, but particularly additional spectrum in the millimeter wave, and that in turn can only be achieved through densification. Also, that's the general consensus. So, um, a small size because of the um, lower distance range at those higher frequencies. So, um, backhaul will therefore have to cope both in more cells and higher capacity per cell. So, I mean, as Caroline noted in her introduction. Um, we're talking about backhaul densification as well. So while current mobile backhaul links have to support hundreds, I think up to hundreds of megabits per second per connection under 4G, under 5G it would be rising and will reach tens of gigabits per second by um, 2026. So leading on from that, we'll need, we'll need sort of denser backhaul as well as better utilization of wireless backhaul spectrum because fiber won't always be available. And the scope for reusing frequencies will actually diminish just whatever you, you do with mitigation as those links get closer together. And the other point, I suppose, that um, I think of is because small cells will often be deployed close to street level, there'll be um, a need for non line of sight microwave backhaul links, which is harder to achieve at the millimeter wave frequencies, but work is promising work is going on in that area. <clears throat> Thank you, Phil. Uh, I have another question for you here. Uh, I'll just read this one out as well. It says, uh, you touch on the impact of governments and regulators in the report. 
especially regarding their uh, sorry, especially regarding fiber rollout. Can you give us an example of the regulators also influence, influencing the use of wireless spectrum for backhaul? Yeah, um, yeah. There, I, mean, I mean, there's quite a bit of that going on as well, and um, we do um, touch on that in the report. And um, the one example I do recall, I think, I was giving is Belgium, um, of a, a country use, encouraging use of millimeter wave spectrum for backhaul through regulation. The country's regulator. Um, BIPT, I think it is, I can't remember what the acronym stands for, has, has designated the E band millimeter wave spectrum that that's 71 to 76 gigahertz and 81 to 86 gigahertz, if I remember rightly, um, to back, backhaul in, that, that's dedicated to backhaul in um, dense urban environments. And that they're sort of pitching that as a um, more affordable and available alternative to fiber in those situations, which really comes back to what we were saying earlier about why perhaps fiber, although it's growing fast, will be perhaps sort of pushed aside by microwave in some urban settings. And we anticipate there'll be more allocations like that, that in Belgium, although with a caveat that demand for microwave backhaul for small and macro cells will depend on the deep on the degree of massive MIMO deployment. And I say that because simply because massive MIMO is a technology that will actually um, improve capacities without densification. So it might so the more massive MIMO there is, the less densification it would be. And that might reduce some um, demand for backhaul over the millimeter wave bands. But I'm not sure that that would be the case. But anyway, that's just something something to think about. Thank you, Phil. Uh, I have another one for you here. Um, on the fiber front, the report discusses the growing use of dense wave division multiplexing in fiber backhauls. Apart from the increased capacity, does this offer other benefits for operators? Ah, oh, yeah, that's interesting. I, I mean, yeah, I mean, we, 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 we've touched the, we've touched on the WDM in various parts of the report, and we sort of discussed the technology. Not in huge depth, some of you have covered elsewhere and it's getting a bit off subject, but essentially just to point out why it's important to backhaul. And yes, there are other benefits apart from the pure capacity. I mean, it's, I suppose it's um, the ability to support different use cases quite conveniently and also for coexistence between 5G and 4G. I mean, I suppose you call those different use cases. Um, the ability, so it's the ability to sign individual wavelengths within a whole WDM. Um, constellation, if you like, um, uh, to each use case that may have uh, different QoS requirements. Some might require lower latency, and some require more capacity, and so on. So that you could actually have maybe two or three wavelengths to one, one to another, and so on, all within a single fiber. Um, and then, so and then because 4G will have to coexist with 5G for some years, um, operators will also be looking to aggregate the two. And one way they could do that um, is by adding 5G radios to existing macro towers that support 4G already and aggregate over the backhaul and core network all the way to their own data centers. And, and again, you see, um, they could assign different wavelengths to each of those, and that would avoid the cost of deploying separate networks while providing a degree of, I suppose, of, um, I don't know if you call it logical separation which will ease management configuration and so on, and scalability. And it could be that some parts of the backhaul are ted dedicated totally to, say, 5G new radio, while others are shared with 4G. So that's probably the story there, as I see it. Thank you once again, Phil. And I think we've got time for just one more question, which has come through. Uh, we, or oh, sorry, um, here we go. You have discussed the impact of capacity on backhaul, but 5G also promises ultra low latency. How can backhaul help enable that? Yeah, um, well, I, I mean, I mean, think about it. I mean, backhaul doesn't help directly because um, because latency over network, end to end connection over network is largely a function of distance. I mean, you, you, you can do you can do what you can in the configuring the network and with new hardware to improve switching times and cut everything to the bone, but ultimately you're left with a base lag determined by the laws of physics. Um, 
so the direct 5G contribution to ultra low latency is largely confined to um, the over the air link between the client device and the radio access network. And, and, so, and the only way you can then bear down on latency is through edge compute. You know, you know. <clears throat> so in other words, you've got to bring the data and the computation closer to the user. And um, that's been on the cards for a while. I mean, it's been discussed in the mobile context for at least 10 years before. But we're now seeing some operators looking to host data and applications themselves for content or service providers. Um, at their sole sites, you know, um, especially in urban centres, and um, the industry is embracing that through several initiatives. And one of them is Etsy's. I think it's, it's now multi-edge, so multi-access edge computing architecture. I think it's called, which used to be called um, mobile edge computing. And um, so, I mean, essentially, there's a, there's a demand for standardisation around that, and also sort of partnerships between. Um, operators and providers of compute and cloud capacity. So we've had, we've had AT&T tying up with Google, and then we've got Amazon Web Services have got an initiative whose name I forget, but they've partnered with both Verizon and Vodafone, among others. So, so really, edge compute is really becoming part of the 5G panoply because of the, that question of latency. I think the other area where that becomes very, uh, very relevant question is um, obviously as we look at front hall and mid hall, which um, uh, th this report is really trying to focus on the back hall element. But as we indicated right up front, one of the, you know, the big technology trends is um, is disaggregating the RAN and then requiring um, connections between the various elements that make the back hall link looks look slow and, and uh, <laughs> low capacity by comparison, um, extraordinarily demanding connections. So, uh, I, so I completely agree with Phil about the role of, um, of edge, very distributed and um, uh, edge-based architectures in, in helping to, to make that happen. And that's certainly um, something we, we have uh, reports coming up in the fairly near future on um, disaggregated VRAN architectures and, and one of the key elements of that I think is will be to extend what we've looked at today for backhaul and say well okay how much does this extend into the various ways that you can do um, front hall and mid hall um, and particularly um, the, the latency requirement on that which is about 10 times what it is for an equivalent backhaul link if, and, and, and a lot more in some um, uh, some scenarios. So, yeah, so I just think that's worth throwing into the mix that we haven't forgotten about front hall, but um, I think all the points that Phil's made today and some of the technology trends that are going on to improve capacity and latency are going to be stretched even further by the requirements of the um, disaggregated RAN. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point, Carolyn, because I mean, I, I mean that, that issue of latency in the sort of front hall and mid hall is almost imposed more by the architecture rather than by the actual or, 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 um, or infrastructure rather than by the actual use case, but it's very, very demanding, and that's something that does have to be met. Yeah. Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, well, I'd like to thank you both, Phil and Caroline, for today, and um, also I'd like to thank uh, all our clients for attending. Um, we will be releasing the next round research forecast this month, and uh, as I said meant before, that will be on the open round. Roughly the open round forecast. Um, so, just once again, thank you, Phil, very much. Informative as always, and thank you very much, Caroline. And Thanks, thank you, John. Yeah. I'll end the poll now.